Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I, uh, I find myself in the peculiar position of um, uh, addressing a room full of scientists and science teachers as a, as a historian. And uh, I am by training a historian of science. It's actually why, why I'm here. It's why I, I took this job a long time ago, a long time ago. And um, I want to thank Max for his very gracious introduction. Max has left the room. Uh, <laughs> um, and hang on, I want to recover Vermeer. Now, this is not just pleasant background. Um, I actually uh, want to start with a discussion of this painting. This is uh, Vermeer's uh, view of Delft. It's painted in 1660. It is um, a wonderful example of Dutch painting in the 17th century. It's a wonderful example of the capabilities of oil paint. It's a wonderful example of the fascination with light and with uh, the treatment of light and with you know Dutch landscape. Dutch landscapes are really skyscapes in the 17th century. Um, and I want to point something out. This painting very much represents the spirit of the 17th century, that emphasis on observation and the notion that if you'd like, Reality and understanding is transparent to human observation and human reason. This painting is done 20 years after Descartes paints, or rather publishes his work on optics. It's done uh, four years before Robert Hooke publishes the first or the second work on microscopy. And so it is very much in the center of the scientific revolution. Uh, it's also published, or rather it published, painted, uh, the year uh, that Isaac Newton enrolls at Cambridge University. And we can really appreciate Newton's chronology because he's just like us. You know, he went to school at 18. He was Cambridge class of 1665. He had, you know, the sweatshirt and everything. And, uh, and uh, Newton, um, uh, Newton publishes the Principia. This is Newton's tomb, by the way. Newton uh, publishes the Principia in 1687. And uh, Newton's laws of motion and Newton's laws of gravity arguably are the, uh, the culminating event of 17th century scientific thinking and the role model for the Enlightenment. Because what this is really about is confidence, the idea that human observation, experiment, and reason, if you'd like, are capable of recognizing the fundamental principles of the universe in a way that predicts phenomena to the millimeter or to the inch, if you'd like. And I want to make that clear. We live in this world of complete, you know, can you hear me? Can I walk away from this thing? Thank God. Um, we live in this world of, of complete prediction. We live in this world where the space shuttle takes off from Florida and orbits the Earth, and it then lands in California. And it's, if it is off by so much as 100 yards, we get very upset, and there are congressional inquiries. You know, we, you know, people brag about you know, which window of a, of a building uh, you know, military weapons can be directed through. We live in a world where you know, if you know all of the forces, all of the vectors acting on a given body, that body's behavior can be predicted. That is new in the 17th century. It begins with Galileo. It reaches its culmination with Newton. And it really is testimony to, if you'd like, this newfound confidence that characterizes the European Enlightenment. And the proof of it is where they bury him. This is Westminster Abbey. This is a yeoman's son from Shropshire, I think. And he's buried 20 or 30 feet away from the kings of England. You know, and if you look at this, it's very humbling. I mean, I've seen it. Uh, this is, you go into the nave of Westminster. This is just to the left. And, uh, you know, Newton's body is in the box. And above him is this sphere that kind of, you know, represents the universe. And Newton's statue is blazing at you. And he's got this expression on his eyes, like, this is what I did. You know, what have you done? You, know, you feel you know, very insignificant. Um, but the real significance of Newton is not just in his work or in his physics, but it's in the effect he has on culture. Um, has everybody seen this film? You know, there's a wonderful scene. It actually really happened uh, where uh, uh, as the broken spaceship, you know, the Apollo spaceship, you know, rounds the back of the moon, they have to uh, light up the, uh, the landing engine on the lunar module do a course correction, and then turn everything down. And they have to turn everything off because they don't have enough battery power to really keep things going. Uh, they need to preserve it so they can do re-entry. And so Tom Hanks, or James Lovell, turned to his crew and said, we just put Sir Isaac Newton in the driver's seat. And I want to point something out. They are in you know, a craft about the size of a Volkswagen bus. There's three of them. In some places, the skin is two or three millimeters thick. 
Uh, they don't have enough oxygen. They have problems with CO2 absorbent. They have problems with batteries. They have problems, well, they have lots of problems. But they're not worried about the equations. They are literally willing to ride those equations home. You know, that's the confidence that is generated by Newtonian physics in general and by the Enlightenment in particular. And I actually asked Jim Lovell if this happened. He was here about eight years ago because he lives in Lake Forest and I got to sit at his table. Not because I was very important, but because my wife is in the physics department, or at least she was. Uh, and I asked him if this happened and he didn't want to talk about this. They really didn't talk about space at all. Jim Lovell spent the entire time speaking about his prostate problems, which was very upsetting. Um, you know, it, 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 it totally blows your view of astronauts. Um, this is Georges Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon. He is the official keeper of the royal gardens for the King of France in the middle of the 18th century. He's working about two generations after Newton, about 15 years after Newton's death. In 1740, he publishes the, 1748, he publishes the first volumes of the natural history. Uh, an enlightenment treatment of nature. He uses observation in the spirit of Newton, in the spirit of Vermeer, if you'd like, and, it, and, and uh, seeks to describe plants, animals, minerals, free of folklore, free of superstition, and over the course of his life, he produces 25 volumes, 12 on vertebrates, nine on, excuse me, 12 on mammals, nine on birds, five on minerals, describing the natural world exactly. And then he publishes five supplements. And in the fifth supplement, this is done around 1760, he does something remarkable. Vermeer, not Vermeer, Buffon has on his land a series of iron mines and a series of iron foundries. And he pays his blacksmiths to make a series of iron spheres from about half an inch in diameter to about six inches in diameter. He makes 10 of them. And he heats them in the furnace up until the melting point, up until the time they're white hot. And then he times the amount of time it takes for them to cool first to the point where they can be touched and then to the point where they are at room temperature. And he draws a curve. And because obviously you know, surface area increases as a function of the square and volume increases as a function of the cube, the cooling time goes up. And so the bigger spheres cool much more slowly than the smaller spheres. And so he draws the curve and extrapolates to a sphere the size of the Earth and estimates that the Earth is at least 75,000 years old. If you assume that the Earth cooled from a molten state, if you assume that it is largely iron, which is reasonable because it has a magnetic field, if you assume that it's still hot inside, which is reasonable because hot stuff keeps coming through the surface. And so basically, if you basically maintain that we are living on the crust of a cooling sphere, Buffon maintains that the Earth is at least 75,000 years old, and in his notebooks he actually says it could be millions. And this is, out, what's what I'm looking for? Earth shattering, because Buffon has just essentially invented geological time. I want to point out that because of the role of scripture in the European mind, you have 6,000 years to work with. If you read Newton's unpublished notebooks, he actually says, you know, the first two or three days of creation could have been of indefinite length because the sun isn't created until the fourth day. And so the idea that those six days are pliable is certainly present in the European mind. But Buffon just expanded the time scale and published it in explicit terms. Furthermore, he does an experiment. Think about this. This is the great problem with the sciences of time, with geology or paleontology or evolutionary biology. You cannot observe phenomena directly in the past. And so you have to deal with the evidence you have. And so he produces this analogical experiment where he seeks to reproduce, if you'd like, the cooling of the Earth through a series, a series of iron spheres. So when we look at Buffon, on the one hand, we can talk about, again, the sheer confidence of scientific thinking and experimental method and pure observation in a post-Newtonian world. But we can also talk about this notion of the sciences of time, the idea that the past is suddenly a subject for scientific inquiry. And in the years after Buffon, um, this becomes you know, an accelerated subject of interest. This is uh, James Hutton. And in 1788, James Hutton publishes his theory of the Earth. And in Hutton's theory of the Earth, he argues that the world needs to be thought of essentially as a machine, as if you'd like, a series of ongoing processes, processes of deposition,
processes of erosion. So if you look at the, at the, uh, the formation behind you, this is actually in his book, um, you know, he's sitting in a boat, you know, drawing this. And if you notice, there are a series of vertical strata at the bottom of the page, and then you have a layer of rubble, and then above you have a series of horizontal strata. Now, strata can only be laid down horizontally in water, so apparently you have a series of horizontal strata that were created, laid down, and then somehow turned sideways, then elevated and eroded, then resubmerged. New strata are laid down above, then the whole thing is elevated, and then people start driving little wagons on the top. And so Hutton points out that the real nature of the Earth's past is about process. It's about understanding the processes of deposition and erosion that happen at a regular rate over immense amounts of time. And I want to point out there is something inherently Newtonian about this, the idea that process is central. Because it's very easy to consider the Earth's past historically. First this happened, then this happened, and this happened. And Hutton makes the point that if you'd like sequential or linear approaches to natural history are misplaced. What's important is to understand the processes that cause these events. And he writes that the amount of time necessary for this goes far beyond Buffon. Two generations after Buffon publishes his account of <coughs> spheres, 20 years actually, Hutton writes there is no vestige of a beginning, there is no sign of an end. The earth is literally millions of years old. Now, it is around this time in the early 19th century that something very familiar starts to happen. Because while you can look at the Earth's past in terms of process, you can also look at the Earth's past in terms of, if you'd like, discrete events happening over time. And as fossil studies increase, and as the study of the Earth's strata becomes, you know, what the word I'm looking for, clarified through the work of people like William Smith, an English surveyor who in the 1780s, as a hobby, starts to put the rock layers of England in chronological order. Uh, the characterization of the periods of Earth history or the systems of geological strata becomes clear. And you know the names, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. These are all named between around 1810 and 1850. And they, they come from you know, English and French geologists kind of wandering around, characterizing systems of strata by their component fossils. The Silurian period is named for the Silures, an ancient Celtic tribe that lived in Western Britain. Cambria, the Cambrian period is named for Cambria, the old Roman name for Wales. And so while Hutton emphasizes a process-oriented approach to time, this emphasizes a linear approach. Time as events in the past. First there are trilobites, and then there are ammonites, and then there are giant reptiles, and then there are mammoths, and then there are insurance salesmen. And the whole thing is, if you'd like, a linear process that can be described by available evidence. And this is very compelling and brings us to Georges Cuvier. Cuvier publishes a work in 1811 where he responds, well, what Cuvier wants to respond to is this. This is a rock. But it's not just a rock. I'm going to talk about it a little bit myself, partly because I grew up in a place that was filled with these things, and partly because I find myself fascinating. Uh, I grew up in Long Island, and Long Island is a, 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 a glacial terminal moraine. It is literally the stuff pushed in front of the last ice sheet. So is Cape Cod. The, le the next ice sheet, if it comes, will push it down to North Carolina. And near my house, there is a rock called Shelter Rock that is literally the size of an apartment building. And Shelter Rock is called Shelter Rock because if you're caught in a thunderstorm, you can stand underneath parts of it. It's huge. It is a glacial erratic. The actual stone formation that it comes from is from the St. Lawrence River Valley. Cuvier is also you know, impressed by these. They are present throughout Europe, particularly ooh, in southeastern France, not too far from Switzerland. And by the way, we understand these things in terms of glacial movement, continental ice sheets, or alpine glaciers in times of glaciation also grow quite large. Continental ice sheets can move these rocks hundreds or thousands of miles from their point of origin. But the notion of continental ice sheets, the notion of ice ages, is not really understood until the 1830s and 40s, 
Cuvier is publishing in 1811. And so he asks a very simple question. If the world is the result of regular processes happening over immense amounts of time, the kind of thing that Hutton stresses, what regular process can move a rock the size of a house 500 miles? That's a good question. And Cuvier's answer is, it can't. The world for Cuvier is, punctured, is punctuated by terrible catastrophes, huge disasters, or I should say dramatic crustal events of volcanism, of flooding, of, uh, I don't want to say plate tectonics, that would be anachronistic, but of crustal movement. And so for Cuvier, the emphasis is not on process. The emphasis is rather on event. The emphasis is on a series of events that have happened over time that have sculpted the surface of the Earth. And so when Cuvier looks at this, Cuvier looks at these distinct periods in terms of catastrophe. Remember that you distinguish Cambrian from Ordovician or Jurassic from Triassic. In terms of extinction, the fossils in the Triassic are different from the fossils in the Jurassic, which means something has killed a lot of things off. And Cuvier says, ah, if you look at the boundaries between the periods, these are relatively sharp. So the boundaries between Triassic and Jurassic, between Silurian and Devonian, are in the end examples of disasters. These are the great catastrophes that have had an effect not just on the lithosphere, but on the biosphere. And so extinction in large bunches is the hallmark of catastrophism, the hallmark of Cuvier. And, uh, He's certain that he's explained this. And so you have this view of the Earth that is, in the end, not predictable, not about process, not terribly Newtonian. Cuvier's science is descriptive but not predictive. And Cuvier's view is very convincing until the work of this man. This is Charles Lyell. And I apologize for these slides of, you know, one after another, you know, kind of dour, you know, 19th century, you know, you know European men with fascinating constructions of facial hair. But, uh, but uh, Lyle, Lyle was supposed to be a lawyer. His father wanted him to be rich. Darwin was supposed to be a clergyman. You know, things don't always work out that way. And Lyle had to quit the law because his eyesight was terrible. And so he couldn't do all the reading. And uh, he ultimately becomes a geologist. He ultimately redoes the science of geology because what Charles Lyle does is four or five years of painstaking field work where he travels through Europe you know, writing down phenomena, accounting for the, uh, the, the, uh, the different structures he sees. This is the most famous, you know, iconic example from Lyle's work. This is the, uh, the Temple of Serapis. It's in southern Italy. It's right near the volcano Mount Nuovo. And um, this is actually an illustration from Lyle's work. But, you know, a photograph works better. If you look at these columns, these are actually standing. The, col the, the, the temple was built in, oh, I think the second century BC. And these are marble columns, and about eight feet up from the base, you see, you know, if you'd like, the effect of a marble boring bivalve mollusk. And so for about four or five feet, the marble is scarred by the damage wrought by these mollusks that literally bore into the marble and you know, leave, a, leave a, a little pit. Now, those mollusks can only live at the low tide level. And so when you look at this, something is very clear. This is not a mountain. This is a, this is, this is a human-made building. And so since this building was built, this region of Italy has been flooded enough so that marine mollusks have bored into the marble, and then it's been re-elevated. And so Lyle points out, and by the way, there is no record of a catastrophic flood in the region. So these are ordinary changes in sea level an inch a day, rather, an inch a year, an inch every 10 years. And so Lyle makes the great case against Cuvier. Lyle makes the great case that, in the end, the Earth's features are the result of ordinary factors happening over astronomical lengths of time. And more importantly, unlike Hutton, Lyle does the exhaustive empirical field work to justify this. These are Lyle's drawings of Mount Etna, the volcano in Sicily. And he talks about how the layers of the volcano clearly have developed over eons. And so Lyle's book, published in 1830, becomes the textbook for modern field geology. Lyle wins the fight. Catastrophism is vanquished. Cuvier is reduced to a footnote. 
And the idea that geology is the result of constant processes happening over time becomes textbook. Lyle, in fact, makes it clear that not only are these processes constant, but their scale and scope are constant. In other words, the processes you see today are the same as the ones in the past. There is no greater extent. There is no greater force involved. And on the one hand, you can argue that Lyle wants to talk about the world in constant terms. But there's something else going on here. Charles Lyle calls this book the principles of geology. And if you call any science book in England the principles, you are channeling Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton's book, The Principia, is, is iconic not just to European science, but to British national ego. They have Isaac Newton. It's very important to them. And so um, when Lyle calls his work the principles, he is saying that he has established an approach to geology that is essentially Newtonian in its character. That just as Newtonian physics is observational and predictive, so is Lyellian geology. Consider, consider laboratory science. You observe your phenomena directly. You can't do that with the past. But, but, if the world is completely consistent, then you can observe the past by observing the present. You can make the case that Charles Lyell insists on a consistent nature because he wishes to do Newtonian observational geology of phenomena that have already happened. So the fascinating thing about Lyell is his motivation is not just geological but methodological. He wants to grow up to be the Isaac Newton of the rocks. And in fact, is quite successful. When I was a kid, in ninth grade, I took earth science. And in the first chapter, there's the obligatory history of geology, little 10-page blurb. And it talks about how Charles Lyell saves the world from Cuvier, catastrophism, ignorance, and an emphasis on the biblical flood. And it's a wonderful story. Until this happens. We're skipping a bit. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> Lyle's emphasis on the cyclical character of nature, on the predictive regular character of nature, is so strong that when he talks about biology, he actually says, if processes are repeatable, if the Earth is constant, then whatever natural processes led to the evolution of giant reptiles will repeat <coughs> themselves, which means the ichthyosaurs and the tyrannosaurs are coming back. Now, his work is caricatured by a cartoonist here, where they have Lyle as an ichthyosaur lecturing to a bunch of other lizards. But he has this wonderful notion of the world as predictive, programmatic, observational, the past essentially as an episode of experimental science. And then, you know, Darwin adopts this. People don't realize the extent to which Darwin is Lyellian in his methodology. Darwin gets on the Beagle in the year 1831. That's the year after Lyle publishes his book. Darwin is 22. He's a young graduate student for all intents and purposes. This is the cutting edge book. And by the way, sailing ships go very slow. He had a lot of free time. He read every book of that, word of that book. You know, he was seasick. I don't know if you know this. Charles Darwin was seasick the whole time he was on the Beagle. He was throwing up over the lee rail. But he was reading Charles Lyle in between heaves. And um, uh, Darwin was... Um, you know, Darwin was at sea for five years. His first papers are geological, not biological, but consider Darwinian evolution from a Lyellian standpoint. <coughs> Darwin is talking about gradual forces happening over time. He's talking about a process that produces change over eons. He's talking about essentially uh, you know, kind of a, a Lyellian uniform approach to biological transformation. And so the, emphasis, the influence of, of Lyell on Darwin uh, is profound. But what about this? People love this. You know, in 1980, the idea that biological change does not happen gradually, the idea that sometimes things happen dramatically in big bunches, is thrust rudely back into the scientific world. Um, and you always know that this is a big deal, because they made how many movies about this? Uh, you know, uh, Deep Impact. Remember Deep Impact? Um, I forget who saves the world. I think uh, um, Bruce Willis saves the world in one of them. And, uh, yeah. and uh, Robert Duvall saves the world in another one. So basically, bald men will save the world from asteroids when they're coming to kill it. <laughs> But the fascinating thing about this idea 
Um, well, let's talk about his background. In 1980, uh, Lewis and Walter Alvarez are doing some studies of the strata around Gubbio in Italy, not actually far from the Temple of Serapis, where Charles Lyell was in the 1820s. And while they're doing these studies, they're actually doing magnetometry studies of the orientation of magnetic minerals in the crust. And they come upon a layer of, stra a layer of literally ash, uh, between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary strata. And when they measure that label, when, when they measure that layer in magnetic terms, they discover a significant spike of the element iridium. And this iridium anomaly is uh, unique to the, to the stratum. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the size of the rock layer. Uh, this is another picture. And when you go around the world, you find this iridium anomaly everywhere. Wherever you have Cretaceous and tertiary rocks in proximity, there is a layer in between that has an unnaturally high level of iridium, something like 20 times the background. In addition, other evidence shows up. There are uh, little spec spectacles of shot quartz throughout the, layer, throughout the layer. There are microtectites, which are small little globules of, if you'd like, natural glass that comes from melt, you know, melting quartz. And they make a conclusion that you're all very familiar with, which was striking in 1980. They make the conclusion that the Earth was struck by a significant asteroid, or perhaps a comet, probably about a kilometer or a kilometer and a half in diameter. And that asteroid uh, had a huge effect, obviously, on the biosphere. It you know, uh, put a lot of dust and water vapor into the air if it hit in the oceans. It uh, you know, hid uh, solar radiation for a period of time. Obviously, there would be a huge effect on uh, the plankton, the phytoplankton in the oceans. Uh, the oceanic food chain would collapse. You would have a huge problem uh, with uh, predators on land. Obviously, large animals with huge food requirements would be adversely affected. And um, you would have a great global dying scenario. Now, I want to point out the, the boundary between Cretaceous and Tertiary is characterized by a big shift, a 65% extinction. And Cuvier would explain this in terms of a catastrophe. Lyle would say that gradual forces happen over time, and the fossil evidence does not actually mirror that gradualism. But what this event demonstrates is, in fact, that to some extent, oh, they, they find the crater by doing uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, radar studies. They find it on the Yucatan Peninsula in, um, in Mexico. And I just found this today. I love these science photo library. Like somebody took a picture of this 65 million years ago. But the internet's a wonderful thing. Um, this is another one. But this is about, if you like, the resuscitation of Georges Cuvier. He's right. Bad things happen. Big, unpredictable, dramatic collisions. Rocks hitting the Earth. Dinosaurs dying. 65% of the species on the Earth go extinct. No land animal with a weight greater than 30 kilograms survives the close of the Cretaceous. And so all of a sudden, the idea that catastrophism can happen, that in fact, maybe a uniform approach to the universe is in, or to the world is incorrect, is revived. And people run with the ball. The best example is Stephen Jay Gould, who passed away recently. Now, Stephen Jay Gould, as a paleontologist, already supported a view of punctuated equilibrium, the idea that evolution happens in bursts as opposed to the more gradualist approach represented by traditional Darwinism. And so Gould would argue that there are bursts of evolutionary steady state, followed by bursts of tremendous evolutionary creativity. And all of a sudden, and he's basing his conclusions on what the fossils tell him. He thinks that there are bursts of speciation and bursts of relative quiet in terms of the evolutionary past. All of a sudden, Stephen Jay Gould has a mechanism for his theory. And there's nothing scientists like better than a mechanism for what they already thought. And Stephen Jay Gould, for 10 years, published article after article about catastrophism, about punctuated equilibrium, about, the, about uh, uh, asteroid collision. And he goes so far as to point out that if we take this as a more common occurrence, if we assume that there's been more than one collision, then in fact most great extinctions are probably caused by unpredictable events, either extraterrestrial or not. And so in the end, evolution is just history. 
In the end, we can understand the processes of natural selection. And clearly, the processes of natural selection always operate. So if an asteroid hits the Earth, what you've done is created a very short-lived environment in which new traits are selected for by different, you know, by different uh, selective pressures. So Darwinian process still operates, but the dynamics of Darwin, the scale of time, is radically different. And Gould loves this idea. Uh, this is a slide of the Burgess Shale. It's a, it's a, 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 a sedimentary found, uh, formation in British Columbia in Canada. It's discovered in 1910 by an American paleontologist who fills the drawers in the Smithsonian Institution with fossils, describes them, and they are forgotten. They are re-examined in the 1980s, and that re-examination by some paleontologists at Cambridge produces a really fascinating view of life where all of a sudden, <coughs> the Cambrian period is filled with animals that are completely un unrecognizable. Um, new techniques of examining fossils in the 1980s. Um, and by the way, these fossils are special. These are fossils of soft-bodied animals, because the Burgess Shale represents an entire kind of pelagic community that is buried in a mudslide and rapidly fossilized. And so they are fossilized in anoxic conditions. So soft tissue survives long enough to be preserved. So all of a sudden, you can look at animals in all of their anatomical complexity right after the Cambrian period, or right during the Cambrian period. And what Gould points out is that the Cambrian period has dozens and dozens of basic body plans, new animal phyla. And so he would argue that life in its earliest stages is more diverse than life in its, life in its later stages. And in fact, the body plans that survive and the body plans that die out are probably the result of an evolutionary lottery. If in the end, evolution is the, worst, is the result of disasters rather than ordinary Darwinian competition. If in the end, you die because a rock hits you, not because your neighbor outcompetes you. If in the end, evolution is contingent and not predictive or at least process oriented, then in the end, the products of evolution are just a matter of chance. And so Gould points out uh, that the body, th that the, uh, the animals that survive are no better than the animals that die out. And had random events been different, we could have had a very different evolutionary history. This is the champion of the Burgess Shale. This is the great predator of the Cambrian. Uh, the, the animal is named Anomalocaris. This is a three and a half foot arthropod with a circular mouth with kind of a nutcracker mouth part and two shrimp-like appendages that stuff trilobites into its mouth. Three feet long, the terror of the Cambrian Sea. And what Gould is saying is, had events been different, this remains dominant. And then he talks about this, this nondescript little fossil about three inches long. If you look at this fossil, and describe it carefully, as the folks in Cambridge do. The fossil has a ventral, or rather, a dorsal notochord with, if you'd like, zigzag blocks of muscle, characteristic of the phylum chordata. This is probably an ancestral, perhaps the ancestral vertebrate. And Gould points out, if this animal happened to not survive whatever disaster ends the Cambrian period, if this animal gets crushed by the asteroid, or wiped out by the lack of solar radiation. There is no reason to suggest that vertebrates re-evolve. In other words, fish don't exist, amphibians don't exist, insurance salesmen don't exist. So there's this wonderful emphasis on evolutionary contingency. Again, if you'd like, natural history as just history, as linear. If in the 1770s you went to the island of Corsica and kept Napoleon parents up all night drinking wine and playing backgammon so that they never you know, do what leads to Napoleon, then there is no Napoleon and no Napoleonic Wars. And the world is different. You know, in fact, Gould calls this book Wonderful Life after the movie, which is about what happens to the world if Jimmy Stewart doesn't exist and everything's different. The question is, is Gould right? And in the end, the paleontological community rejects a lot of his ideas. On the other hand, how can you respond to asteroid collision in a way that preserves Lyle's notion of a Newtonian past, Lyle's idea of a geology that is essentially laboratory science? A group of paleontologists at the University of Chicago take another tack. David Rock, 
and Jap Sepkoski take a look at the statistical uh, samples of fossils across the geological record. And they trace all extinctions statistically and feed them into a computer. And they find what they believe is a periodicity in extinction. Basically, what Ropp argues is that every 26 million years, there is a mass extinction. If you look at, sometimes it's a small one, 8, 10%. Sometimes it's a big one, 65%. The biggest of all is at the end of the Permian period, 95%. How do you explain this? Clearly nothing terrestrial. And so David Ropp goes to the astrophysicists and asks, how can we explain this? And the astrophysicists come up with nemesis. The idea that the sun has a dark companion star, a brown dwarf perhaps, at a distance of about one and a half light years. And every 26 million years, it comes to the closest point of its orbit. Its gravity disrupts the cometary matter in the Oort cloud beyond the orbit of Pluto. And the inner solar system is bombarded with asteroids and comets. Sometimes the Earth gets hit by a little one, and you get 10% species loss. Sometimes the Earth gets hit by a big one, and you get 95% species loss. And Ropp actually publishes a book called The Nemesis Affair, where he tells the story. And then three years later, he publishes another book called Evolution, Bad Genes or Bad Luck, where he argues that all extinctions are probably the result of asteroid collisions. Because people love a headline. But there's something fascinating about this. This is Lyellian uniformitism, uniformitarianism taken into space. Notice. In the end, these things are predictable. There is a regular process. It just involves a dark companion star every 26 million years, and we can predict its orbit. There's something fascinating about this, not just in terms of the actual data, which is compelling, but in terms of the scientific habits of mind, because science is about prediction, and no one wants to accept a contingent view of the past that is just history. No one other than Stephen Jay Gould. And by the way, this has not been dismissed. People still argue about this. They've re-looked at the statistics. It turns out that ROP statistics aren't so good, and they've reworked them. But the notion of periodicity still exists, and the astrophysicists are still arguing about what could cause it. Now, is Gould right? Is ROP right? Is asteroid collision a random catastrophic process that is unpredictable, or is it part of a larger, regular process that ultimately human reason and scientific examination can understand? We can't speak to it. It's something that is still you know, uh, an open question. But I want, to, um, I want to talk about the significance of all of this. Number one, it's intrinsically interesting. It's a great story. There is nothing better on a Friday when a blizzard is coming to listen to the history of geology. <laughs> it warms up your day. I tell my wife history of geology stories all weekend. She loves it. Um, but there's something else. On one level, this subject matter is extremely useful. I'm going to give a little commercial for the history of science. This subject matter is extremely useful if you are trying to, how can I put this, expose students to the nature of scientific method. The nice thing about the history of geology is it is eminently accessible, at least at a given level. And this story of uniformitarian versus catastrophic views of the past really helps students recognize the nature of experimental method in a Newtonian sense and the limitations of that method. Because in the end, if you cannot observe phenomena directly, are you in fact doing experimental science? There is a term that people use. They talk about the scientific method. And in fact, you can argue that that term is justified. You know, notions of reproducibility, notions of peer review, notions of, of revision, the idea that any scientific model is subject to change in the face of new evidence. These are universal to the scientific enterprise. On the other hand, you can also argue that scientific dif disciplines obviously differ with respect to methodology. And this story is an excellent example. When you are dealing with the sciences of time, when you are dealing with disciplines that involve phenomena that cannot be observed directly, do you do the same thing methodologically, epistemologically, intellectually, that you do in a chemistry lab? You know, that's a fascinating question. And so methodologically, I would argue that the history of geology is a, is a very useful 
you know, way to teach kids uh, the nature of scientific thinking in a methods course or in any science course. So on one level, it's useful methodologically. But on another level, what this story is really about is what we can't know. Think about the nature of 20th century culture in the West, 20th century science. Now, there is plenty of 20th century science that is you know, kind of traditional laboratory science. It's been incredibly fruitful, and, and this, this institution is dedicated to it. But the 20th century also, culturally and scientifically, is about recognizing the boundaries of human knowledge. What cannot we know? Can we really know the past as well as we know the present? Is not time a limit? To be sure, Isaac Newton gives us great confidence. We've been living in an enlightenment world ever since, and the things we don't know today, we know tomorrow. That is that wonderful positivist confidence that characterizes the West, the world, in a scientific age. But are there things that we just can't know? And I don't just mean with respect to time. You know, consider, um, consider evolution. This is one of those traditional evolutionary family trees that we've seen in the past. This is you know, the evolution of the horse. There's you know, Eohippus and Mesohippus and, I don't know, Cruddy Hippus and slightly better Hippus <laughs> and even better Hippus and then you know, Equus, awesome Hippus. Now, this is the kind of linear look at evolution that is very deceiving. It implies that evolution is like technical change, that things happen in, in a direction. Uh, obviously, these animals would branch out in different directions. This is the only representation I could find on the internet. But if you look at a traditional evolutionary family tree, they will use fossil species as the branch points. And so, for example, you know, Eustenopteron is a lobe fin fish, and if you look at a traditional evolutionary family tree, you will have Eustenopteron, and then you'll have a branch, and you'll have you know, species of amphibians and other species of fish. And the assumption is that the fossils we have found are the branch points in evolution. In other words, we have found the fossils that represent the significant events in evolutionary change. And if you think about it, we don't really know that. We don't know that the fossils that we find, that the species that we found, are the species that have the mutation that changes the nature of the group. And so, since the 1980s, you know, taxonomy has been cladistic rather than traditional. The idea that when you talk about evolutionary relationships, you have, if you'd like, a baseline, and the different lineages branch off in the order of their relationship to each other. But if you notice, the branch points aren't identified. We no longer claim to know which species represents the branch point between you know, bears and pinnipeds. We simply know that the branch existed. In other words, we recognize that this is something we cannot know. Consider quantum physics. Do you know if the cat in the box is dead or not? You know, in the end, do you not recognize that because in the act of observing nature, you change nature, there are elements of nature that are not knowable precisely, only probabilistically. Einstein is wrong. You don't, Einstein is the avatar of Newtonian certainty. When Einstein says God doesn't play dice with the universe, he means in, in the end, we can know the universe with predictability. Special and general relativity are predictive theories. And Einstein, in the end, is set aside on this question. Because there is a point where, in the end, the act of observing changes nature. And so we are dealing with probabilities. You know, when photons go through slits at the same time, it is testimony to our lack of the, to, to, to the, to the limits of our ability to predict. So on the one level, this phenomenon is a very useful you know, look at methodology. On a second level, this is a very good introduction to that 20th century notion of the limits of human certainty, to the limits of scientific thinking. And on the third level, we can go back to Vermeer. You know, when you look at this, it seems like, uh, how can I put this, a photograph. It's a very realistic painting. And you get the impression that Observation has captured the essence of Delft, the city of Delft. And then you have to recognize something. It took Vermeer three months to paint this work. There were cloudy days, there were rainy days. There were days when there were fog. There were days when the coloring was different. There were days when the light was different. So does this represent the reality of Delft, 
Or does this represent the artist's imposition of order on this order? In the end, is he not creating the notion of permanence, the notion of control, the notion of knowledge, where in fact a changing world is quite different from this? And I would like to contrast it with this. This is Van Gogh's painting of his bedroom. You can go see it at the Art Institute of Chicago. And people love this. They love its colors. They love its hominess. They kind of like the idea that you know, Van Gogh is showing us where he lives. He even has a portrait of himself on the wall. But in the end, the artist has deliberately departed from every rule of perspective, every rule of three-dimensional representation. And he's done it in a way that is brutally honest. He is telling you, this is subjective. This is my view of the world. How much of the artist is in the art? For Vermeer, this is brutally clear, a lot. This is my view of the world. But you can argue that this is just as true for this painting. How much of the artist is in the art? How subjective are our views? How much of the scientist is in the science? How much of yourself gets put into theory? Especially when you're dealing with phenomena that are uncertain. How much of Stephen Jay Gould is in Gould's views of mass extinction? How much of Isaac Newton is in the notion of a periodic approach to the universe? And so the nice thing about the history of geology with respect to this kind of phenomenon of the pace of change is not just the way it illustrates scientific method, but the way it illustrates 20th century thinking. And so in epilogue, I just want to show you where this can go, this notion of predictability. In 1983, I was, uh, I was 20 years old, and uh, I had hair. And <laughs> in 1983, I went down to Washington, D.C. for some kind of a protest. I don't know why I was there. I was there to occupy some of the nicer bars in Georgetown. And, um, and while I was there, I stopped into the Smithsonian Institution, the Museum of Natural History, and they had this. This is a dinosauroid. This was actually an exhibit in the Smithsonian Institution, and the argument was simple. Clearly, asteroid collision is, if you'd like, a disaster that wipes out the dinosaurs, which means, had it not happened, the dinosaurs may not have died out. They may not have lost two mammals in a fair evolutionary fight. We needed a rock to kill them. So, if they don't die, what would have happened? And the argument is that this particular bipedal bird hip dinosaur with a significant brain cavity might have evolved into that bipedal, binocular vision, opposable thumbs. It has no mammary glands because dinosaurs don't nurse their young. It has no external genitalia because reptiles retract theirs, which is cool, but you know, somewhat startling. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I've really, but. <laughs> Think about this represent, what this represents. It represents two things. The idea that, on the one hand, there is a predictive character to evolution, and it ends with us. Think about every science fiction movie you've ever seen. The universe is filled with people like us. Now, that's partially because of the actors' union. You know, <laughs> you need human actors, and so everybody has two hands and two feet. George Lucas always had these cantina scenes filled with various tentacled creatures. But Star Trek, the world is filled with people like us. In Avatar, they're tall, thin, and blue, but they're just like us, except they have an Ethernet cable in the back of their head. Um, the point is that the idea that somehow we are inevitable, the idea that evolution does go to a predictive end, the idea that somehow the past is directed or predictable, uh, is, 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 is woven within us. Because this is absurd. There's no reason to assume that dinosaurs you know, evolve into lizard people, although it's a fun idea. Anyway, I want to thank you all for, uh, for coming and bearing with me and listening to the history of science at what is a science conference. I want to thank you for coming here on the day of a blizzard. I want to caution you as you walk around the school. I want to point out that this institution was designed in the 1970s while the nation was in the grip of a terrible drug culture, and so it's affected the architecture of the institution. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank you for coming and for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you.